I'm happy to say Werner Herzog joins me now. Uh, hi, welcome to the show. Hello. Uh, I'm uh, fascinated to be on it in the cloud somehow. I know. it's it, <laughs> Maybe it's just a rumor. <laughs> it, is, it is a bit strange how many people I'm talking to directly inside their living rooms or their offices. Well, that's not my living room. It's the office of my wife. That looks nice, though. Yeah, lots of books and stuff, yeah. Um, it's it, it, Normally you would be coming on to talk about a specific film, but we're here to talk about you today. As a, as a filmmaker, someone who makes things about things, how, how comfortable are you talking about yourself? Uh, well, I should avoid it as much as I can because my person is pushed too much into the foreground. And over it, if you do not go and point out to the work I've done, uh, the, the the essence of what I'm doing is is getting blurred and is getting lost. It, it does feel like that sometimes. I was reading this um, book of conversations with you called Werner Herzog, A Guide for the Perplexed. And in the interview, Paul Cronin says, most of what we've heard about Werner Herzog is untrue. What do, what do you make of that? Uh, I think he refers to the rumors on the internet and to the uh, to the imposters and doppelgangers on the internet who are claiming to be me and uh, wildly exaggerated events that take on its own life. So um, there's something uh, which uh, starts to depart on its own trajectory and uh, it, it's not me anymore. But it doesn't matter. It, it, I don't care. I don't care what how many imposters I have and voice imitators I have on the internet uh, and what's going on on Facebook or Twitter because I'm not on Facebook. However, there's a Facebook account and there's Twitter, but it's all uh, forgeries. Do you find that ever pe people ever think they know you before they meet you? Like, do you ever feel like your, your reputation sort of precedes you? Uh, I don't know, and I don't really care. <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame you. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about something maybe a bit more tangible. Um, t talk to me a little bit about, about growing up in Germany. Talk to me a little bit about growing up in Bavaria. What are your, some of your earliest memories of growing up there? Well, post-war memories, of course, it was a wonderful childhood, but of course in poverty and we had, uh, for example, no running water. You had to go to the uh, well with a bucket and bring it in. And of course, no television did exist, but no radio, no telephone. I made my first phone call when I was 17. When, when, like when, like when did even for young day, young people today, and good a good childhood, wonderful in it, closed in itself, and and as happy I would say as uh, childhood of my friends later who grew up in the ruins of the city. They they had the everybody says ah oh, it must have been terrible for children to grow out in bombed cities in bombed out cities and uh, and they had the best times of their lives when did they still rave about it when did when did cinema first enter your life when did you first start to become aware of it well aware that it existed when i was 11 when a traveling projectionist uh, passed through this tiny village in the bavarian mountains i didn't know cinema existed and then later, when we moved to Munich, because I had to go to high school, um, it was that I saw films, but it was American B pictures or C pictures. And I always had the feeling, oh, I, fairly soon I had the feeling I, I would do it better. Hold on, the, the, a traveling projectionist would come to your town and show you films? Yeah, well, it would show some films when I was 11. My, it didn't impress me at all. My, my father used to tell me stories like that, too. He grew up in rural Newfoundland, and he would tell me about the idea of going to see a film was something that would only happen like two or three times a year when, you know, someone would come to town and they'd all get together in the church hall. And I've always thought about how special that must make films that I can see on my phone right now. Uh, not really. It didn't impress me. Why not, and you think? Because the films, they, they showed two films, and they were both lousy. 
So you knew without context that they were lousy. You knew without having seen in any other films that these. Well, that there was a context. Good. One was about uh, Inuit or Eskimos at that time, called Eskimos, uh, building a, an igloo, and you could tell right away that uh, it was apparently extras from a studio who had no clue how to handle snow and ice. But I knew because I grew up in snow and ice. So I had the feeling they, they did a real lousy job and and it was a bad movie. So you said when you went to when you went went to Munich there you saw films, American B pictures, and you knew you could improve upon it. You knew you could you could make things better. No, no, it's that's a secondary thought. I somehow I, I knew I would make films or I would be a poet. And uh it became clear, yes, uh, uh what I see uh, is is not really good. And I had to invent cinema in a way. So I, today I still feel like an inventor of cinema. What was the first thing you shot? Do you remember the first thing you shot on, on camera? Yeah, sure. I shot a short film. I started out with uh, short films and one is first one called Heracles. Uh, and then some featurettes. And then I started to make feature films. But did something click for you the first time you picked up the camera when you looked through it? Were you like, oh, no, yeah, this is it. This is what it's supposed to be. No, no, I, I felt comfortable with it right away. There was nothing nothing special about it. It was natural. I, I, I know it sounds very day-to-day. That sounds very cool to me, just to be candid with you. Like, that sounds rare that someone would pick up something yeah, like well, that you know you're you're, uh, you're talking like like somebody in the uh in the internet media or so of course cool or so is is important but let me give you another example i was dragged into staging operas as a directing operas and uh i can't even read music scores um and i was very reluctant to do it and I had never seen an opera staged on in an opera house. So I went in as a complete novice, having no idea about how it was supposed to look like um, and not being capable to read music scores. But since I had no, uh, no clue about uh, staging of operas, I uh, created something that was completely unusual in the context of the trends of the time, and it was a sensation. And <clears throat> what I try to say, what I'm trying to say is, from the first moment on on the stage and with singers and with an orchestra, I felt completely at ease, as if I had done it years and years and years. In, in, 19, in 1972, you released... Complete confidence. Oh, yeah. I, I, I love that. I love to hear that something just, it, it made, it was it never had something you had to adjust to, something you just understood inherently right away. I, I, I take something from that. I, I can relate to that yeah, feeling. But it's, you know? it's not cool either. It was just uh, that I was dragged into something that was natural to me because music has played a very intense role at that time already. Um, no, and, and, and I don't mean to... Um, Use the word "cool" in the in the wrong context. I just mean that I know I can relate to when I first picked up a guitar. My father gave me a guitar. I didn't have to worry too much about it. All of a sudden, everything just kind of made sense to me. I thought that was interesting. I thought that was cool. Yeah. I didn't have so to. So it felt it felt uh, appropriate in your in your hand. Yeah, different than a, a pencil it did for math or something. You know. Hand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that is cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it enters my ear here and exits that ear. On the <laughs> so in, in 72, you release what many people call your breakout film. It's an epic drama called Aguirre, The Wrath of God. Um, it's, it's, I, I want to take a listen to some of it. Take a listen to this. Ich, der Zorn Gottes, werde meine eigene Tochter heiraten und mit ihr die reinste Dynastie gründen die je die Erde gesehen hat. Zusammen werden wir über diesen ganzen Kontinent herrschen. Werner Herzog, can you tell me what's going on in that scene? Well, it's at the end of the film where the Spanish conquistadors have killed each other off and they are dead from diseases and starvation and 
their raft uh, where they are floating down an Amazon tributary in search of the mythical gold land of El Dorado has been invaded by 450 little monkeys. And he grabs a monkey and Aguirre, the leader of this uh, group who calls himself the wrath of God, he says, I, the wrath of God, will marry my own daughter who is actually dying from an arrow wound. <laughs> I will marry my own daughter and together we'll found the purest dynasty the world has ever seen. Together we shall rule this entire continent. Uh, so it's, it's complete madness. The film ends in complete madness and the camera circles around the raft then and it's a very strange, very intense end of a film. What do you remember from making that film? What did you learn from making that film? Um, well, it was a difficult one. Uh, you have to imagine that the film was made with no, no real budget. Uh, and it's a big film when you look at it uh, on a big screen. It looks like for Hollywood, it's a $100 million film uh, production value. Uh, and uh, I had a grand total of budget of $360,000. So that's no money at all. And how do you make a film with uh, a crew of eight and costumes and cannons and muskets and uh, native uh, tribal people and uh, you just name it? It seems impossible. Yeah, but you have uh, to be in defiance of what the production means are and you have to to make the best out of it. So that's what I learned early on, that uh, um, money is not uh, handed over to you by production companies easily. So I produced it myself. People who study your films often say that there are two ongoing themes in your work, impossible dreams and the indifference of nature. I'm, I'm not as interested in what people say. I kind of want to hear from you. Uh, how do you choose your subjects, be it uh, fictional films, be it documentaries? There's not, not too much choice. I, I've said it before and I have to repeat it here. It's, they come uh, to me mostly uninvited. I do not plan a career. I never had a career. And they come at me like burglars in the middle of the night. So that's how it happens. Like you're, 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 a vehemence. It's a vehemence of something that comes at me. And, and a very good example is my last uh, feature film, uh, Family Romance, LLC, which I shot in Japan in the Japanese language. And there was this kind of ferocity of... Uh, and urgency of, of doing this film. So I, since there was no money, I financed it out of my own pocket and no, almost no crew. I watched uh, some of your online masterclass and I heard you say that most of my documentaries are, are feature films in disguise. What did you mean by that? Well, because they use, they are in fact uh, quite often, not always, quite often feature films in disguise because I stylize, I invent, I rehearse, I cast, I cast my, uh, my feature films, uh, my documentaries like feature films. So it's all uh, methodologies of feature films. And I'm not a fly on the wall like uh, some of the documentary filmmakers would postulate uh, insipidly. <laughs> I, I am a creator. I keep telling them, you are creators. You are not a fly on the wall. You create a film. And of course, documentaries, I, I have made it clear in all my uh, docu quote unquote documentaries that documentary should divorce itself from journalism. That's one of the main things. 95% uh, of what you see um, in the world of documentaries is actually a bastard child of, of journalism. Well, let's take a listen to a clip from one of your documentaries, and I, I want to talk more about this. Take a listen to this. You know, I'm a Christian, so, you know, I believe that, you know, paradise awaits one way or the other. So I tell people all the time, I'm either going home or home. So I'm either going home to the world or home to God. So I'll, 
you know, as the days get closer, I can feel the pressure on my shoulders. Uh, they call it clinical depression, where I just start having less motivation to do things, less energy. Um, you get frustrated at the at the system. How can they not see, you know, my situation is wrong? Uh, you know, I, I I used to write all the time and have a lot of energy, and I just don't have it anymore. I just feel like I've been beaten down. That's from the 2011 documentary Into the Abyss. I think the common perception of like, you know, people who aren't in the film industry, people who aren't, people who just sit home and watch films on Netflix is that documentaries, oh, they, they present a series of facts and they, they leave it up to the viewer to decide. I, I'm interested to hear you talk more about that, that that's not the way you approach things, that it's different than journalism. Well, this is a very deep uh, look, a fearless look into the darkest recesses of the human soul. It's uh, the man who you hear speaking is Mikey Perry, who was, uh, when you hear him eight days later, he was dead, he was executed. And we knew, or he still hoped for last minute clemency, which doesn't happen in in Texas. In the state of Texas doesn't have clemency, (laughs) technically and Theoretically, yes, but it's not uh, being used. And um, of course, uh, in in what you are showing here, you do not see the man. He looks like a very nice young kid. But I must say, I've never seen a man as dangerous as him. I have, I've been in very dangerous situations. And I've seen very, very, very dangerous men but never anyone like him. And when you look at him, you will be startled because he looks like a very sweet kid. Um, but uh, what, what is staggering about the case and about him is the, uh, uh, the depth of nihilism of, of the crimes, a triple homicide, and then afterwards, uh, later, a few days later, shootout with police and uh, crimes before that, and it's just staggering. Okay, but, staggering. But, but, but go back to me then about how you treat this documentary as not being one of, of journalism, that you sort of divorce yourself from the idea of, I have to give the facts about this case, what you were saying before in, in this context. Um, well, the film transports some of the facts of the case, but I'm not in the business like you would always see in documentaries on death row, uh, trying to argue about the innocence uh, or guilt of the perpetrator or those who are going to go to the execution chamber. Uh, it, it is not in this. And I said to Michael Perry and to the others, I did eight films about death row inmates. I told them in writing before, and that's part of the protocol, uh, this film is not meant to uh, uh, somehow establish your innocence or your guilt. I'm not in this business. So uh, in other words, uh, I'm interested in, in something else, in something deeply human. Um, and, and I keep telling everybody I'm not an advocate of capital punishment. That's one thing. And number two, you hear it all the time. Ah, oh, they are monsters. These guys, these people are monsters and they should be killed off. Uh, and uh, I, I do not agree. No, I do not agree. Yes, the, um, the crimes are monstrous, but the perpetrators are still human beings. And I approach them with a very human attitude and, and they notice that. And, and I'm very harsh and straightforward with Perry within the first 120 seconds of the film. I tell him, uh, Mr. Perry, although I know your uh, childhood was very harsh and life has dished out a very bad deck of cards to you, but it does not exonerate you. And it does, now comes this, and it does not necessarily mean that I have to like you. Mm. And it's, he's startled. He's startled. Nobody has ever told him something like that because the family is always protective. The attorneys are always uh, giving these fake hopes to them. The guards are always somehow uh, in, in, uh, in very harsh and, and see them as monsters. Very often they treat them like monsters. And, and all of a sudden I speak with a different voice to them. I do not have, 
I don't have to necessarily, uh, do not have to like you necessarily. So uh, it's a different attitude. And of course, uh, I'm trying to look into um, the field around them, the people around them. And I'm speaking, for example, with an illiterate or somebody mm. who just learned uh, reading and writing. Mm. And he's a young man who who was not on my list of cast of characters. You see, the film is very, very well cast. For example, the former captain of the tie-down team, Fred Allen, he's after 125 executions, he all of a sudden has a breakdown and leaves uh, the prison system, even though he's only a few weeks away from his pension. He could have waited two more weeks and would have uh, received a pension. He quit from one day to the next. And there's a, there's a deep inner strength in him and, and how he speaks about capital punishment from, in my opinion, is the biggest argument against capital punishment or a Ill former illiterate young man. And I had never met him before. I just grabbed him, put him in front of the camera. and st I had no idea who he was. I had no idea. I only heard from another young woman whom I uh, had on camera that he knew the both perpetrators. It was not only Mikey Perry, but also Jason Burkett, two murderers. Um, and um, in the way I'm engaging him in, in a very, very deep conversation, in, in a few minutes, uh, I reveal more about, about the, the human soul than other films in a, an hour and a half or, or or then or then articles do i Werner, there are there are people out there who are experts in your work and have done unbelievable like critical analysis of your work and i understand that, that they can speak to your work in a certain way i'm not i'm not one of those people i haven't done i haven't read 45 books about your work leave or anything like experts, that experts leave the experts so let me let, 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 let me tell you this then for god's sake let me tell you this yeah. let me tell you this like i sometimes feel when i when i read a news story that i'm supposed to just understand what what was going on in the news story i you know i'm told what was happening i'm supposed to have some kind of preconceived judgment of the story and i think even now more than ever when we're to surround by the news at all we're all trying to find it uh we're all trying to reach some kind of like meaning behind that or emotional core or maybe what the word i'm looking for is like an emotional truth that these people aren't just names in a byline these people aren't just names in a web article these people are not completely dehumanized they are people with stories and backgrounds and ways about them whether that brings empathy or not i don't know i do find it interesting that you got there like i do find it interesting that that's what your films are about and then when you read a story about someone on death row that's what you see. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I understand what you are trying to say. Trying uh, is a great there, word for that. There's, yeah. a deep, there's a deep curiosity in me about uh, what is our human condition? Who are we at this very moment? And of course, it starts at a, at a different, at a more lower level about facts. What, what do facts, what, what are facts and what is truth? What distinguishes them? In films that are too much after facts are always uninteresting. That's the journalistic kind of things, and uh, so and and of course everybody is confused nowadays about um, fake uh, um, fake news and and manipulated facts. But since we have the internet, it's very very easy for you. And of course, in the time before of the print media. It's easy for you, faster for you to get to the bottom by, by corroborating a story, corroborating facts. You have at least five, six, seven different angles on it. The evening news, for example, which is part of show business, it has de degenerated into show business, entertainment industry. Uh, you can corroborate what you hear and, and uh, switch on to other news outlets. And I mean, not only in the United States, which, for example, very, very interesting, Al Jazeera. <laughs> it's very interesting. Forget about how they report about Israel. But in other things uh, going on in the world, they are very, very good, different angle, or Russian television, very fascinating. Or go into French TV or whatever language you speak uh, and try to find out or... Uh, if somebody is, I, I do remember that in Germany there was a controversy about the German Pope 
the predecessor. Uh, uh, Benedict, yeah. Benedict, yeah. Yeah, uh, Ratzinger. Um, and uh, yes, yes, Josef Ratzinger. And uh, uh, I just had the feeling there was something not, didn't feel right. And I went straight to the um, speeches, some of the speeches of of Benedict. Uh, for example, his speech in Auschwitz. Very short and very deep plowing speech. And all of a sudden, uh, you, you have a much, much deeper and different understanding of what you hear uh, on the news. Very easy. Uh, you just access uh, um, the, uh, the website of the Vatican. You can read every single uh, speech that the current Pope has delivered. Every single one in full, in full text. Yeah, and 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 what and why why would you to try and better understand the actual the reality and the reality of what they're saying no, versus we, what we're being told what they're saying? Um, well, yes, yes, to understand to to get a better grip on 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 reality on the real world, and not a perspective of the world. I, I want to see different. I want to see different perspectives and corroborate things and find out find out very very quickly. What you just heard is a lie, or is manipulated, or it's a fake, fake news. You can find out very, very quickly. So, so maybe this is maybe this is the best way to end things off. Then is that if like if you were to make a movie about now, about about 2020, when we are we are questioning what we're being told, we're we we see if, depending on what news outlet you subscribe to. I mean, Obama said this a couple of months ago. He said if you are listening to NPR in the United States and you're watching Fox News in the United States, you're living in completely different worlds. What's 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 the Werner Herzog film about 2020? I don't want to make a film about. Uh, what the news are, that's uh, uh, the profession of journalists. I'm a poet. Or just the so, world. I mean, what, what's yeah. interesting you about the world in this time, in this day, right now? Uh, of course, I'm a keen observer. And since I'm a guest in the United States, I'm not a citizen. I'm, uh, I have a different position because I can watch what is going on without the possibility of voting. So that restricts my interference, uh, my possibilities of interference. But of course, uh, as I live here and as I like the United States, otherwise I wouldn't live here, uh, I um, have a very, very keen interest in, in what is going on. And I follow, uh, I follow with great participation of my heart how America is, uh, um, is struggling at the moment. It is, hey. It's. It, I'm not there. I'm in Canada. It feels like it's struggling when you're there. Um, it definitely feels like watching here from Canada, but I never know how it feels when you're actually in it. Um, well, I'm. I'm in it, but uh, uh, not as a citizen. Werner, it's been nice to talk to you. Thank you very much. You, you take care of yourself. You too. Don't break a leg. <laughs> <laughs>